so let's go on. Here's, a, here's a, the beginning of part two. Uh, and we begin at, uh, um, where do we get? To chapter 12, verse 21. Then Moses called, so God's told him to do all these things. Then Moses called the elders of Israel. So he'd said the congregation, and now we see kind of the structure that you and I have. The elders of Israel and said to them, so these are the leaders. Essentially, these are the leaders of the household uh, in the, in the uh, very unorganized structure that they have so far. But he said to the elders, go select lambs for your family. Slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. So now that's the, the plant like with the celery-like stalk on the top of it that you could use for a brush. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that's in the basin, and touch the lintel posts, the door posts of, uh, of your house uh, with the blood in the basin. None of you shall go outside the door of your house until morning, for Yahweh will pass through to strike down the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two door posts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you down. You shall observe this right as a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. So notice he's just repeating what he heard. But the re repetition, of course, is saying how important this is for us. And, and for all of us readers, it's saying, this is it. And, and, this, and in effect, if, if God was laying it down here, Moses is going to the elders now and whack, 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 nailing it. Or he's nailing the map to the wall or nailing it all in place and say, you all get this in your heads. Um, and, and now here's the education part. When you come to the land that Yahweh will give you, so notice that's way off, as He promised, you shall keep this observance. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, it's the Passover sacrifice to Yahweh. He passed over the houses of Israelites in Egypt. He struck down the Egyptians, but He spared our houses. And the people bowed down, and they worshipped. So, of course, the elders, um, increasingly what I want you to see here, and again, as a little uh, foretaste of, of everything that we see in the Christian church right down to today, the first part is, you all are going to do this with your own family and for your own family. You all, elders, are the leaders of your family. You are the one that are to do this. And uh, in terms of education, the education will start in your household. It will start, first of all, by your own observance. You do these things. You observe the Passover. You eat this meal. And there will come a time when your children will be old enough to say, why do you do that? Notice, why do you do that? Your child hasn't yet, so to speak, become a full member of the society. And so you will educate them into it by saying, this is what the Lord did for us when we were in Egypt. Um, um, and so notice the personal application. Again, the destroyer will pass through and will come. The destroyer is coming to every house. And again, this is a, a crucial part of the New Testament teaching, you know. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us stand under the judgment, uh, the just judgment of God. And so this picture of the destroyer coming is such a, it's such a, a brusque but really important picture of us. Um, why is it important for us to have faith in Jesus Christ? Well, because this picture, the picture of the destroyer passing through the land and saying, Every life is owed to God. Every life has fallen into the sinful path. And every life is justly forfeited to God's goodness and glory. Uh, only with God's own provided lamb, only with God's own provided sacrifice, will uh, God and you see the sign. You see, there's the picture of faith with your application of this, but now it becomes very personal. Each parent doing this in their own uh, house and each parent becoming the educator of their children. My dad was a fifth grade teacher. When he retired uh, after 35 years of being a teacher, uh, and he was a fifth grader. He loved teaching fifth grades, uh, graders because he said, uh, fifth grade is the last year they're still children. After that, they become, you know, snotty middle schoolers. And uh, <laughs> you know, they talk back to you and all that. But I remember uh, uh, hearing somebody ask my dad one time, Ed, what's changed? My dad was taught mostly in California. Ed, what's changed in the last 20 years that you've been in California? And uh, he said, the one thing that's changed the most is, I could tell over the course of my life the things that parents used to teach their kids at home, they now expect me to teach them in the classroom. And what he meant was the simplest things, you know, 
kids used to come in and they would say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And now, you know, I have to teach them this is the respect that you owe any grown up. I have to teach them basic manners, how they're just to act to one another, how not, you know, that this is what you do in a classroom. So anyway, how important, and notice that it's set right here. Every parent will teach us, this is what my dad was saying, that this job, if it's not done in home, and if it's not done by the parents, uh, it's too late by the time. And so anyway, just a, um, I know that my dad knew that very uh, distinctly in his own life. Um, so, and you shall say, he spared our houses. Uh, we'll talk some more about this. The Jewish way to remember things. You step into it, reenact it, put yourself in that place. So now, here it happens. Verse 29. At midnight, Yahweh struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So, in other words, he did exactly what he said he would do. Pharaoh arose in the night. Now, think about that. He's the Pharaoh. He's got, and he has a palace full of people saying, don't dare wake the Pharaoh. You know what will happen. He, will have been so, he, he has wiped out whole families with that. So he's the God around here. So don't disturb him. So when Pharaoh's household awakens crying because everyone in his palace has lost a family member on this night, that in a way, this is the crusher blow, the chokehold on the Pharaoh when he has to get up uh, in the middle of the night and, and then he has to humiliate himself. He and all his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt. Now remember back uh, when the Israelites were, had, uh, were in slavery and we, heard, we read, and God heard the cry and we we'd read, you remember we said, and the, the uh, Israelites cried out. Remember we said they didn't even know who to cry to. They cried out. Well, that cry is the uh, word that's used here. So now you see the Egyptians, in effect, is saying, now you all, it's your turn to cry. And so, including the Pharaoh, everybody from top to bottom now, it's the Egyptians' time to cry. There was a loud cry because there was not a house without someone dead. Then he summoned and literally requested Moses and Aaron in the night. So here, now remember the last thing he said is, don't you ever let me see you again. And now he's saying, boys, come here. I, I need to talk to you. Please come. All oh, right. You know, so here is the Pharaoh, the God on earth now, uh, not only showing I can't hold off the angel of death, the destroyer of death, but also saying I can't. Um, and now I have to call back these little toads that I, I ran off, you know, uh, they're so often. And now notice even the, the last little pathetic humiliation. Not only do I have to say that, and he said, rise up, literally up, uh, leave, go away, leave my people, both you and the Israelites, go. He, in Hebrew, he just says three things, up, leave, go. So, uh, so what's he doing? God said, not only will he, will he tell you, let you go next time, he will command you to go. So that's the point. I, I wish the translation here showed he's commanding them, up, get out, go. Three uh, things he's saying right in a row. Worship Yahweh as you said. Take your flocks and your herds as you said. Be gone. Now notice this. And bring a blessing on me too. <laughs> so... So, you know, you talk about the degradation of the highest, the most powerful figure on earth. Uh, you know, you have this, uh, the last thing. And, and just pray for me, okay? And, uh, um, and, of course, the whole point is, he doesn't believe it. He's not saying, I want to follow your God. I, you know, Yahweh has shown me. I should belong to him, too. Um, he didn't mean that. 33, the Egyptians urged the people to hasten their departure from the land, for they said, we'll all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their cloaks on their shoulders. And of course, this is what they're supposed to remember in the unleavened festival that's going to come ever after that. Why? Because they did it like this now. Remember, everybody said, get out, get out, get out. And so we all had to run and go. And so the, the whole point of the festival is you're going to reenact this for years and remember this story. And remember also the glory of that night. You see, it's both things. You were having to leave everything, yes, but remember, that was your victory on that night. And that's what the next thing say. That was your victory. God won you the victory. 
Um, so the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls wrapped up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The Israelites had done as Moses told them. They had asked the Egyptians for, now here we have the whole thing, jewelry of silver and gold and for clothing. And Yahweh had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. And so they plundered the Egyptians. Now just uh, interesting uh, language here. Uh, so again, we've got to come back to this. He struck every firstborn in the whole land of Egypt. Uh, one thing that's the hardest for us to remember, I, I mentioned this last week, and I, I don't think we can hold on to it too much, is that this story is being told to Israelites who for 400 years, and at least since the last two pharaohs, have been under the most abject, cruel kind of domination. They have watched their baby boys tossed in the river. They have seen the Pharaoh say, you all belong to me. I own you and say, I have every right to try and wipe out you if that's what I want to do. So uh, that's what we have to remember. You know, our Christian sympathies are sort of so easily tweaked and we think, oh gosh, why did they do everybody? Why didn't he just go to the Pharaoh, you know, and poke him in the eye and knock him out and throw him in the river and then we'd all be done, you know. And well, no, the whole, you know, the Pharaoh is a whole society and that whole society has been living on the cruel uh, punishment of the uh, these Hebrew slaves forever and ever. And so everything that is happening to them now is payback for what they've been doing. And it's very just payback. It's not, you know, everyone who hasn't been doing it. This is the thing when you have a tyrant, you always also have a society of people who shut their mouths, who willingly say, oh, isn't that awful? and who just watch it happen. And of course, this is true around the earth. It's true every society that's ever been on the earth. That, you know, you can't have a tyrant without willing folks who, you know, gosh, if only I was brave enough. But I can't because that would, you know, think how that would affect me, how it would affect my loved ones. So I can't stand up, you know. That's the person that's missing in uh, every one of these occasions. So, uh, you know, uh, okay. Uh, so, the Pharaoh, though, everybody gets struck. And why? Because it, it is just uh, vengeance. Um, the Pharaoh, uh, bring a blessing on me. Of course, he doesn't believe it. I was reminded, uh, somebody mentioned um, Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, you remember, uh, they're talking about, does everybody deserve a blessing? This is what tagged it when they said, and bring me a blessing too. And of course, he doesn't, he doesn't mean he now believes in Yahweh. You remember in Fiddler on the Roof, there's a young Russian Jew. And of course, they're, they're the people who have been persecuted for years and years. And uh, he's talking to the rabbi in the village. And the rabbi says, um, well, there is a blessing. There is a suitable blessing for every person on earth. And so the young guy, he loves being kind of uh, provocative. And so he says, Rabbi, is there a blessing for the czar? The czar who's run us from village to village and killed our people. Is there a blessing for the czar? And the rabbi thinks for a bit and he says, May the Lord bless and keep the czar far from us. <laughs> So, you know, so well, that's the Pharaoh, you know, bless me. And he said, yeah, I'll bless you. All right. I'm, I'll bless you from a, a thousand miles away. How about that? Um, now, when they get the jewelry, a lot of people, this is a conscience uh, thing for them, too. Aren't, aren't they aren't they extorting this from them? Well, of course, again, in some ways, it's payback. It's uh, just uh, compensation for all they've been denied as slaves all these years. But really, the, the main point is that Yahweh has won. And what they are not doing is they're not sneaking off in the middle of the night. They're not skulking away. The point is that Yahweh said, they're going to tell you it's time to go and they want you to leave. That's the first thing. And the second thing is they're going to treat you like they would treat their own children, their own neighbors, their own brothers and sisters. And that's what they're doing. And that's what this word means. They found favor in the sight of the Egyptians and the Egyptians did give them these things. But notice then there's this little wink, military language. Thus the Israelites plundered 
the Egyptians. Well, that's what you do after a conquest. You see, you plunder the people you've conquered. So very clearly, uh, this is the language of conquest. And uh, military language here, the Israelites are described as going out company by company. Well, that's battalion by battalion. So, so what we want to see is Yahweh has conquered and his people get the just uh, rewards. Which, um, anyway, so, okay, let's roll on. 37, the Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about uh, 600,000 men on foot besides children. A mixed crowd also went up with them, and livestock in great numbers, both flocks and herds. They baked unleavened cakes of the dough they'd brought out of Egypt. It wasn't leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and couldn't wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this number, 600,000. Notice it says men. So that means, well, okay, there are also women and children. So by every calculation, everybody says at sort of the lowest number, this is at least a couple of million people. Now, just think about those people just walking out of any place, streaming uh, out. And they say, you know, could even Egypt at that time had had a couple of million people in it? Well, one response is, well, listen, what was the Pharaoh griping about? It was that they were multiplying like bunnies, you know, so, you know, that would be a bunny number. <laughs> so, so anyway, I mean, it, it, in terms of the story, it does make sense. Uh, another suggestion, this, I, I mentioned this uh, Jewish commentator, Nahum Sarna, Nahum, he has the prophet's name, Nahum. Nahum Sarna says um, that it's possible that this word, 600,000, the Hebrew word for thousand there, elef, is uh, kind of indefinite. People, I mean, it can mean several different things. And among the things it can mean is, instead of a numerical thousand, it can also mean a group an undefined group, and it can mean a group in the sense of a clan or in the group of a military unit, like a company or a battalion. So what, what um, the author could mean here is, and there were as many as 600 clans that went out. Well, how big is a clan? Well, you know, more 70, 80, may, at the 100 people maybe. But anyway, so if I say 600, then we're talking about 600 clans or groups or battalions of people. Uh, even if you add the women and children, then we're talking about tens of thousands of people. So at least uh, nobody knows uh, what this number means. But um, uh, and there are even, well, it, nobody knows, so let's leave it at that. So anyway, that one makes the most sense to me, that the word t translated thousand can also mean groups or uh, family gr uh, groupings. But notice also, it wasn't only the, the Israelites who went out. A mixed crowd also went out. Well, obviously the Egyptians over these years, they had taken everybody in. Remember, they came down because of the famines that were ravaging the Middle East. So obviously lots of other folks came in. So there, it, whatever size this crowd is, it has lots more of people who are non-Jews. Uh, okay, 12 verse 40. The time that the Israelites had lived in Egypt was 430 years. Now Abraham had been given a round number. Your descendants will be slaves 400 years. At the end of 430 years, on that day, all the companies, there's that military word, of Yahweh went out from the land of Egypt. That was for Yahweh a night of vigil to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That same night is a vigil to be kept for Yahweh by all the Israelites throughout their generations. So this chapter, these chapters are a script to be read and enacted forever. Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance for the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but any slave who's been purchased may eat of it after he's been circumcised. No bound or hired servant may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the animal outside. You shall not break any of its bones. The whole congregation of Israel shall celebrate it. If an alien who resides with you wants to celebrate the Passover to Yahweh, all his males shall be circumcised, that he may draw near to celebrate it. He shall be regarded as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and one for the alien who, rides, um, uh, who resides among you. I'm sorry, and for the alien, one to, for all of them. All the Israelites did as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron. That very day Yahweh brought the Israelites out of the land uh, of Egypt. Now, I just want you to notice one little thing. Uh, it's easy for us to get hung up on, oh, but still, they had slaves. They were slaves. They just got left out of being slaves. Why would they still be slaves? Well, that's a talk for another time. What I want you to see here is the openness of the ceremony. 
What is the circumcision? It's the, it's the mark of, it's the faith mark of belonging to the Jewish community. Um, so, in, in effect, the thing is saying any foreigner can come into the Jewish community if they make what you and I would call the public profession of faith, uh, which for the Jews was, this, was circumcision. We would, so, it's, in other words, here is the equivalent of, we would say, any person baptizing, uh, being uh, baptized and professing their faith, they come into the community. So here is a first little universalizing indication uh, in, the, uh, in the going out of the Jews as they establish their new land. So uh, that, that faith sign will be the sign of inclusion, of, of uh, coming into the community. All right, now we have three minutes for all of chapter 13. Well, we're not going to do the whole chapter anyway, but let's read uh, kind of the first half of it. Because I want to get to Jan's question about the firstborn. This is the last thing. So we have the Passover directions, and here's the other one then, about this whole meaning of the firstborn. Because now it, it also turns into a ritual for all ages. Yahweh said to Moses, 13.1, Consecrate to me, dedicate or devote to me all the firstborn. Whatever is first to open the womb among the Israelites of human beings, beings and animals is mine. Moses said to the people, remember this day on which you came out of Israel, out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because Yahweh brought you out from there by strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Okay, we've established that today. In the month of Abib, there's the name, you are going out. When Yahweh brings you into the land, and this is the promise he made before, of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you'll eat unleavened bread, so the Passover, and now the feast of unleavened bread. On the seventh day there'll be a festival to Yahweh. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. Okay, good. No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession. No leaven shall be in your territory. You shall tell your child on that day, it's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It shall serve as a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead, so that the teaching of Yahweh may be on your lips. For with a strong hand Yahweh brought you out, you shall keep this ordinance at its proper time from year to year. Now I want you to just look at one little verse. All of these uh, things with the Passover, look in 13 verse 9. It shall serve for you as a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead. If you've been to Israel, or you can see this if you go to New York or other places where there are Orthodox Jews, what do they do before they go out of the house every day still? They have what's called the phylacteries. They have a little wrapping around their hand to carry the little box of the commandments. And they, have, and they also wrap it around their head, a little box on, that's on, on a strap. And it's right here. It looks like a little unicorn uh, in front of their yarmulke. And, and uh, what's in there? Well, the scroll and this verse, 13 verse 9. And notice it appears again at 13 verse 16. It shall be for you a sign on your... So this is a fundamentalist, we would say, a very literalist way of reading this prescription. What's God say? This shall be the sign on your hand. Well, it might be a way of saying, you'll carry this with you forever. Keep it in your head, and we might say, in your heart, you see, on your right hand, or keep it with you always. Um, but they take it very literally to say, no, bonk, fasten it. What's in there? This regulation is in there, along with Deuteronomy 6, the Shema is in that little uh, box that they, of commandments they carry on their head. And they see these two verses as the God's regulation for it, God's uh, requiring of it. Um, now I'm going to just finish the next little section. When Yahweh has brought you into the land of the Canaanites, as He swore to you and has given it to you, you shall set apart, so notice we're back to the consecration of the firstborn, all the first that opens the womb, all the firstborn of your livestock that are males shall be Yahweh's. Every firstborn donkey you shall redeem with a sheep. If you don't redeem it, you must break its neck. Every firstborn male among your children you'll redeem. When in the future your child, your child asks you, what does this mean? You'll say, by strength of hand, Yahweh brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, Yahweh killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, human firstborn and the firstborn of the animals. That's why, therefore, I sacrifice to Yahweh every male that first opens the womb. Every firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall serve as a sign on your hand and an emblem on your forehead that by strength of hand Yahweh brought us out of Egypt. Now, what's the meaning of the firstborn? The meaning of the firstborn is, uh, as I said, the firstborn is the captain of the kids' team. 
And that's the emphasis of in this whole culture, you see. And why, do you, why then the, the firstborn? But notice, the image here is the firstborn belongs to God. It has to be sacrificed to God. Now, of course, did the Israelites go around, you know, slaughtering their firstborn sons? And the answer is, well, of course not. Why not? Still, they acknowledge that this child belongs to God by buying the child back, by paying in other words, the, here's this word again, a price of the ransom of my child. Notice this is exactly what Yahweh was doing with the death of the firstborns in Egypt. He was, he was paying the price to ransom his uh, firstborn back from Egypt. He was taking his children back for himself. Yeah, and so Yahweh's claim is, as the Creator, every firstborn, because you see, that's the world recreating itself now, doing the work I put it here to do. Every one of those, every child, in other words, belongs to me. Who, who is the firstborn? He's the captain of the team. And in the same way that we, you know, that the captain, the coach at the middle of the offseason says, I designate this person and this person as the captains for next year. Well, what do they do? They start every game. They go out and they are the ones involved in the decision. Do we kick off or do we receive? Well, you know, why didn't somebody else back on the bench say, that guy can't call a coin flip? Let me in there. Call, you know, well, no, the captain decides for the whole team. And the way he goes, we all go. So the symbolism of the firstborn is, but so when the firstborn, when God says, the firstborn belongs to me, he's also saying, they all belong to me. All of those who come after belong to me. Now, just one last thing. Think about this symbolism then, because we do exactly the same thing. Uh, and, and actually, in Numbers uh, 18, 16, the price is actually established. Well, what's the price then of buying your child back? And the answer is, well, they establish it was five shekels of silver. Um, but you see, you pay the five shekels essentially to the priest in order to get your child back. Now, think about what we do when we bring a baby in for baptism. What do the parents do with the baby? They say, I trust, I, I confess this baby belongs to God. And then what's the next thing they do? They give their baby away. To whom? To God in the person of the minister standing there. To the church and say, this baby belongs to God. Then the baby is marked, sealed with the sign of baptism. And then the baby is given back. Well, at that moment, the baby is given back as a way of saying, this is God's trust to you. This is not your possession. This child has now been marked as belonging to God. So we, we get our understanding of what we're doing in infant baptism right exactly from here, from the notion of redemption and ransoming uh, the child that uh, comes here. Now I want you to just to see one more uh, little thing. We see the sign that was put on the mark here. Notice that this little picture is, uh, you know those pictures that, well, a negative of a photograph. This is a negative of the way God would fill in uh, our redemption. Notice this has to be blood here at the foot that's in the little basin. And then when God sent our redemption, think of this little song. See from his head, his hands, and his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? This is a negative of what you and I see as the sign of the redemption of the whole world. And it is the same thing. Without the shedding of blood, says Hebrews 9, there is no forgiveness of sins. But the miracle of God is that he who was the firstborn of God was sent not to be redeemed, but to be the lamb, to be the redemption price for the whole world. Again, in the book of Hebrews, it says the problem with the lamb's blood is it's not worth very much in the redemption culture. It can't buy very much. It buys one household's worth of, of uh, you know, redemption for the year. So, but the precious blood of God's Son, when it was poured out, avails for everyone who has faith in Him. And so through Him, we come and, and uh, thank God for the Lamb that God Himself has supplied uh, for us. 
The whole of our understanding of salvation, of the substitution of Christ's life for ours, of the price that for, by which our life was bought back and now we belong to God, uh, is established right here in the story of the Passover and the giving of this uh, redemption to the people of God. So that's the end for today. Let's uh, close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these things too high, too deep, too rich and wonderful for us to take in in a moment. And we thank you that you allow us to come together uh, week by week and, and uh, moment by moment that we spend uh, with your scriptures, uh, reading over them, uh, drinking them in, feeding upon your word. Uh, help us, Lord, to grow in our understanding of what you have done through every age, how you have supplied uh, the glorious gift of uh, salvation to your people, uh, and that you've called us now to enter into that family uh, joyfully, wondrously, and to uh, offer this great gift of salvation uh, through our words and through our speaking to others around us. Help us to do that in the love that we share and in the love that we show to others. Let our light shine to others that they may give glory to you, that they may follow you, that they may come to your Son, our Savior. For we pray as we live in his name. Amen.